PCI band at solid ground next week. It's going to be so good. James, let's pray for you. Father God, we uh, thank you that we have the opportunity to sit under the preaching of your word this morning. And uh, just as we uh, turn our hearts towards you, Father, uh, will you bless James as he shares in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Solid Ground. It's great to be with you. So much life on the campus. Walked in, it was like a party. I want to go to refuel. Sounds amazing. And like blue t-shirts everywhere. If you've got a blue t-shirt on, you're part of the kids' ministry team. And uh, it's like half the church that's out there at the moment. It's amazing. Um, are you guys doing well? It's good, eh? Your rubbish taken away this week? You can thank me later. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I just want to clarify that um, it was a great honor to go pray this week. Um, I did not pray cleansing prayers. I don't know what those are, but, um, but, uh, but it was a beautiful invite to just go pray. And I trust that some seeds were sown and that uh, people uh, will be receptive to the kingdom, um, which uh, is about King Jesus coming to be Lord of our hearts. Uh, the, the church is actually in def, uh, defiance of the world systems, by the way. We're a colony of heaven residing in an in, 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 in empire uh, or empires in the world that we don't really subscribe to um, the ultimate authority, although we are called to honor their authority where it doesn't go against what we believe in following King Jesus. Uh, but actually, um, we are not looking to an earthly leader for leadership. We are looking to Jesus, our man who is in heaven. And uh, so that's a great privilege. And um, the more we can get that into our hearts, that we are citizens of heaven, and Jesus is re reconciling the world to himself. Heaven is not going to be a cloud in the sky, but it's going to be you and I on earth with Jesus walking with us, and everything will be in submission to him. It is is worth living for. And, um, and, and, and you know what? If I don't drive the most amazing car in this life, and if I don't get the best salary, and if I don't get all the reward I feel I should get out of now, it's okay. I just want to tell you it's okay. That's why Peter can write, um, and Paul can write to people that were even serving under the oppression um, of, of taskmasters. They were slaves and say, serve your masters with joy. It's gone quiet. We, we should be able to suffer in this life with joy that this is not all we're getting. So, like, I can get a little bit loose now because I'm, I'm, I'm leaving soon. But, um, I'll just leave it right there. Hey, we appreciate um, the people um, that do the things like sweep our streets and clean our garbage and, and, and do those things. And just remember, in this whole story, there are two sides to the coin and there are two, two um, perspectives that we need to consider. And so I understand that there's been anger and frustration and, uh, and so have I. And I, I don't get all the processes. I don't like politics. I don't believe politi politics can sort anything out. I think South Africa is a victim of party politics right now. It's not about occupying a position to serve the people. It's, trying to, it's about trying to stay in power, and we can't work together because if, if the ANC does something that's in favor of what the DA, DA brought as a good idea, then it looks like that we're saying the DA is good, and, and so no one wins. No one wins in politics because it's about me staying in power. It's not about me being like, you know what, it doesn't matter what color t-shirt I'm wearing. I'm here to serve and love. Okay, so that's my rant over. Turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 to 6, verses 13. can start the preaching clock. Okay. All right. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 14 
And we'll read up to 6 verses 13. Let's read together. For the love of Christ compels us, since we have reached this conclusion that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. From now on then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective, even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, yet now we no longer know him in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. Everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, we also appeal to you, don't receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time I will listen to you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. See, now is the acceptable time, now is the day of salvation. We are not giving anyone an occasion for offense so that the ministry will not be blamed. Instead, as God's ministers, we commend ourselves in everything, by great endurance, by afflictions, by hardships, by difficulties, by beatings, by imprisonments, by riots, by labors, by sleepless nights, by times of hunger, by purity, by knowledge, by patience, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, through weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left, through glory and dishonor, through slander and good report, regarded as deceivers yet true, as unknown yet recognized, as dying yet see we live, as being disciplined yet not killed, as grieving yet always rejoicing, as poor yet enriching many, as having nothing yet possessing everything, We have spoken openly to you, Corinthians. Our heart has been opened wide. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. I speak to you as my children, as a proper response. Open your heart to us. May God bless the preaching of his word this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we pray, Lord, that what is shared this morning will build and strengthen your church. I ask, Heavenly Father, that you... Uh, would uh, use me this morning to say what you had once said and to help me, Lord God, not to say anything, Lord God, that would be contrary to what you had once said this morning. I pray, Lord, that we'd come under the conviction of your word by the power of the Holy Spirit and that, Lord, at the end of the service, there would be great joy in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, Vanessa and I... um, made a big announcement that we have been um, asked to lead a church in KwaZulu-Natal, and we have said yes. Um, And I want to take you on a bit of a journey of a bit more detail this morning that I trust will be um, a building up for all of us as uh, we process a transition as a church. So I ask you, come on board with me. If you are new or visiting and maybe you're new to who we are, I pray that uh, you would learn something about what God has done in our lives and that it would encourage you this morning. Vanessa and I took on the leadership of Solid Ground in November uh, 2016. I think it was the 12th of November that we had the handover Sunday. We did two Sundays in a row and um, took over from our parents who had planted this church At the time that we um, decided, or not decided, but uh, responded rather, to God's call to come to Middleburg, we were living in Australia. We both had uh, good jobs with some good prospects. Uh, We had just become citizens, and uh, we were really involved in a church that we loved. And uh, we were about to, or we had just had our first child, Kingsley Lennox. And uh, we came... Uh, We got the invite to come and lead solid ground, and the long and short of it is that over a period of time, we felt God speak so clearly to us 
that we realized that if we didn't do this, it would be a matter of obedience or disobedience. We were so excited to come to Middleburg. We were overjoyed. It's like you could offer me any other job at that moment. You could offer me to stay in any country at that moment. And, and I would say, no, 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 the place that we are going to is Middleburg, and we couldn't be happier. Vanessa and I have always found a few things to be true of major life-altering moments or when God moves us. Firstly, what's happened is that we've felt a weight lifting off of us regarding our current responsibility. All of a sudden, you feel like a, 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 a shift change as to what you're currently doing, and you feel like a burden is being lifted off. Uh, this can feel quite unsettling. Uh, sometimes this causes you to feel like, why is this happening? Am I being unfaithful to the task that I've been given? Uh, is this a bad feeling? Is this a good feeling? Um, then there has been a genuine invite from somewhere else. And um, there is then accompanied an excitement and a vision for the prospect of the invite. And then there is encouragement from the right voices in our lives, godly people who are mature. And then God makes the details happen. This is how God has moved Vanessa and I along. So last week Sunday, we announced to the church that as we come to the six-year mark of leading solid ground, uh, we believe our time has come to an end here, and we've accepted the invite to lead West Point Church in Durban. West Point Church is led by close friends of ours, Brian and Caitlin Barnes, who I met on a ministry trip five years ago to the United States. Um, Brian and Caitlin have been invited to lead a church plant downtown San Diego, uh, a, a church whose pastor died of a severe illness, who reached out to another church in the outer suburbs of San Diego called Light Church, led by Benjamin and Jennifer Horning. And um, that church is in a suburb called uh, Encinitas. And um, they said, hey, will you help us establish a leadership for our church? And can we, can we in a sense, come under your covering and be a site of your church. And through a process of relationships and, 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 and uh, strange happenings that God had orchestrated, uh, this couple phoned Brian and Caitlin, having met them, and said, we really believe that God is calling you guys to come uh, to the USA. Would you consider? And uh, that was a process of investigation, and Brian opened up to me about it. And, and that's when he said to me at the con first conversation of telling me, he said, Man, now you can take over West Point Church. And like I said to you last week, uh, I giggled uh, as he said that to me. Um, but a week later, realizing that the pattern of how God has moved us in the past was actually being repeated in our lives. Um, I, I believe that we all have one major assignment uh, tied to our calling and gifting. All of us have a major assignment. Uh, we got an assignment from heaven. Um, yet, we are all called to more than one task in our lifetime. So, if you're an engineer here this morning, uh, you might be a really good engineer, and the assignment, in a sense, on a, in a worldly perspective of your life is to be an engineer, to, to engineer stuff. I, I, that's the most I know about engineering. Um, to make bridges and furnaces and stuff that makes the world go round, you know? You guys are really important. I just want to honor all the engineers right now. Um, I mean, if there was an option for the world to continue and it was like, um, would you rather have a bunch of Instagram influencers or engineers? I think I would choose the engineers. <laughs> if you're an Instagram influencer... Praise be to God for what you're doing. Okay. But, but, so you might have an assignment of engineering, but you'll live in different places and you'll do different projects and different tasks. So Vanessa and I are called to pastor. We've come to realize this. When, when I was a kid, I used to pretend to preach. When the other kids were playing outside, I, I came to the pulpit after my dad preached and I opened the Bible and I pretended to host a church service. As a good indication. People used to call me Pastor James. Uh, Vanessa also has a rich testimony and heritage. Um, actually, she's a descendant of Andrew Murray, who you would know was the um, founder of the Reformed Church in South Africa. And, um, and um, um, 
Vanessa has a radical testimony of um, growing up in a household where um, uh, there was an element of religiosity, re religiosity, but there was no life-giving following of Jesus. And um, uh, God really called her through, a, specifically through a friend, um, uh, Kirsten Bossoff, who was Kirsten Fulyun. And uh, she used to go to youth ministry uh, with a guy called Sean Adams at Church Unlimited in Nelspruit when she was a teenager. And uh, funny enough, actually, we still have connection with Sean Adams to this day. When we moved back to Middleburg, Sean Adams reached out to me and said, hey, um, just want to welcome you back to the area. And uh, Renus and Ashley also have had much to do with Sean Adams. So it's amazing. Someone who was instrumental to my uh, wife hearing the gospel still ministering to young kids to this day, leading the youth in Nelspruit. Um, at, the, at the beginning of the year, this year, I felt God solidify for me what I want my life to be about. I think it's important for us to decide at some stage in our life, what's, what's, what's the most important thing that, that, that God is asking me to uphold in my life? And I felt four things. I, I, I want to be an excellent husband. Uh, this came from a, a preach moment where Rory Dyer shared a story where he felt God say to him, um, you've been, a, you've been a, um, an average husband, uh, but, but I want you to be an excellent husband. And, and, and I think all of us as husbands can be challenged by that and say, Lord, I, I don't want to just uh, get by in my marriage and make it to the end and, grim, uh, and, and endure this thing called marriage, but I actually want to learn to love my wealth, a wife the best uh, I could ever do. Um, I want to be an intentional father. Um, John Tyson is famous for his books and teachings on parenting, and he's done fathering really well, specifically with his young uh, son. But he speaks of, you know, we can be a different, couple of different kinds of fathers. We can be an absent father. Uh, we can be a present father. Um, or we can be an intentional father, and an intentional father really makes sure that we set our children up with wisdom and the Word of God pressed into them for the future that will keep them in their time when they get to live out their lives. I want to be a faithful friend. I want to make sure that I honor my friendships in my life and that I don't just easily walk in and out of those who have given their hearts to me. And I want to be a holy pastor. In a time where there is so much scandal surrounding uh, pastors and preachers that have uh, not finished well, uh, Lord, I don't want to be a celebrity pastor. I don't want fame. I don't believe anyone is built for fame, to be honest. The more I live, the more I realize that it actually has got such a corrupting power. None of us can actually handle it. Um, I just want to be a holy pastor. I want to be righteous in my private life. I want to be righteous in my public life. I, I, I want what heaven gives me. I don't want to go seeking or grabbing for that which, which will build my platform and, 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 and I don't know, um, put more on my shoulders than God ever intended. An excellent husband, an intentional father, a faithful friend, a holy pastor. What would you write down this morning if, 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 if you had to ask yourself, what four things do I want to be kind of the legacy of my life? Vanessa and I want to preach the gospel. We want to see church communities grow and flourish as they live out what the Bible teaches us. We would be involved, and we have been involved, and we've looked to serve whether we paid or not uh, in the church. And it's something I believe every believer in Jesus should accept into their life, is that actually God has called us to serve in His church, whether full-time, part-time, or no time, just to give. We love God. Jesus is our King. We are living for His return. We are willing to give up whatever He asks of us for His will to be done. And at this stage in our life, what we have to give up again is being close to our family. And I know many of you don't live close to your family, so maybe you're looking at that and being like, well, what's the big deal? But yeah, for us, I guess that's our personal reality, that we've enjoyed our time to have our kids grow up with their grandparents around and their cousins, and all of my brothers are in Middleburg, which has been a great blessing. But we have to be willing to let go of these things, friends, for the sacrifice of the call of God. Um, this is not the only life that we're going to be a part of. And so I will be with my parents and brothers and sisters, and we're all part of the family of God uh, for all eternity. But in this life, we have to be able to say, you know what? If God calls, 
then I can say, I love Jesus greater than these things, and I say yes first to Jesus. We love His Word and the presence of His Holy Spirit. We love His people, the church. And so the assignment over Vanessa and I will be to be pastors, and this will be over our lives, we believe, until the day uh, we pass through the veil of what the world calls death and what the Bible calls sleeping for the believers. Um, but the task, the, uh, the when, the where and the when, if you can say the assignment is the what, what has God called you to do in your life, and the tasks are the where and the when, they can change, can live in different places at different times. Um, this will change according to the times and seasons that we believe God has decided for us. And we've just personally resolved to be ready for these moments. To be ready also, firstly, to settle down for the task that God gives us and to say, if this is what we do for the rest of our life, then so be it. And then also ready that when God brings that task to completion to say, okay, Lord, we're ready to pack up, to sell, to leave behind and to move again. About 14 years ago, um, a leader of, of a church, uh, 3CI, was actually a guy called Heinz Schrader. Um, he prophesied over Vanessa and I in a, in a, in a combined leaders meeting um, that our lives would change every five to six years. It's not a word that we have ever lived upon or projected into our future. In fact, I've been really skeptical of it, uh, and I don't believe it's wise to project those words onto your future and to be like, okay, Lord, I guess we've got five years now again, so what are you going to do after five years? Like I said the other week, it is not good for us to live with one foot now and one foot in the future. We must be all in in the place that God has us. But here's the funny thing. Vanessa and I um, spent six years in 3CI, 2004 to 2010, six years in Australia, 2011 to 2016, and six years in solid ground, 2016 to 2022. In 2014, while we were living in the USA, a preacher from the South called us up who didn't know us. Where's that South African couple? So we went up. Vanessa and I had speaking, been speaking the night before. Um, I was doing a band thing, and it wasn't working out. And Vanessa and I were growing concerned that we were nearing our 30s and that we had not started having kids. And um, it just became a bit of a stress for us. We're like, are we doing the right or the wrong thing? And we had quite an intense conversation um, in the lead up to that Sunday, in particular the, the night before. And so the preacher from the South calls us up and he says, I, um, I rarely, if ever, prophesy about people's kids because it's a really sensitive issue and I really need to know that I've heard from God. But I feel really confident to tell you this. You guys are worried about having kids. And God says, don't worry. The time is not now. You can rest. You will have kids one day, but now is not the time. So all of a sudden, confirmation, listen to this guy. And then he says to us, I see your life and your ministry like a, a zigzag. You're going to go, you've gone from one place, didn't know us, South Africa, so I'm just thinking in my head while he's saying this. You went from one place to the next place, and you're going to go from place to place, and your ministry is going to be more than one place. And, um, and then he said um, that one day he felt we would have a ministry in Western Europe. In 2017, um, on a trip to the USA where I met Brian, uh, I was prayed and prophesied over um, by the team at Bridgetown Church in Portland. And um, one of their pastors, Bethany Allen, um, brought up, said, you know, you know that your name means supplanter, James. It means one who takes over. Um, in March 22, this year, I went on a trip to Dubai and Lisbon, and uh, after I preached at um, our friend's church uh, in Dubai, an old lady came up to me and she said, I, I have a word for you, can I share it? So I'm like, of course, I love words, tell me. And, uh, and she said, I... I just couldn't get out of my mind as I watched you preach this picture of an archipelago, which is a chain of islands. And I just feel that God has got more than one place for you and Vanessa, that your ministry will be multiple places. When I was in Lisbon, Western Europe, something clicked internally, and for the first time in years, I, I thought about the prophecy regarding Western Europe. 
I think, I think what that did was plant a seed in my heart regarding Middleburg that for the first time in five and going on six years of being in Middleburg, Vanessa and I had not even considered the idea that we might not be here for 20 to 30 years. And for the first time while I was in Lisbon, I thought about that prophecy and God just started to kind of like work in my heart. All that said, by the time the invite came from Brian, God had already been doing groundwork in our hearts and the invitation lined up with the assignment over our lives and the prophetic utterance that we'd received. And we had to stop and consider, God, are you saying something here? And then after a process of prayer and processing with Rory Dyer, a close friend and an apostolic gift to solid ground and with the elders of the church, um, it became clear for us that God and to the elders witnessed by them, which was really important for us, really important that those who we've been entrusted to, who we are accountable to, would also witness to this. And I so appreciated just the rawness and the openness of the elders sharing last week that these things are not easy. And, 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 and actually, the, the, the goodness and the, and, the, and, the, and the beauty of accountability and a team and not one person where everything falls upon them. I don't know how many of you have been in a church where, where everything falls on the pastor or the duermany or the bishop. And, 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 and that guy almost has like he's, he, he's like elevated to a level above everybody else. And no one can question or no one can ask or no one can say, hey, why are you doing this or, or what? And I just want to give testimony to the fact that there's a group of men here who care about Vanessa and I who care about this church, and we're willing to go through those tough conversations in order to say, okay, let's get to the bottom of what God is doing. And I appreciate them. And I'm grateful that solid ground is in safe hands, whom God has appointed elders in this church. And so there was such a beautiful witness in them. Henta and Christelle shared last week just uh, them receiving word. And, and, uh, and each one, I can recount, even Amberlene, Rian and Amberlene, who served as elders on this, in this church for how many years? Uh, guys, 20 plus? Yeah, it's 50 or something. <laughs> Almost as, I don't know how long as um, you, and, you know. Anyway, when did you meet Rian and Amberlene? What was the year? Can you remember? 1983, okay, so pretty much the length of this church, okay. So, um, um, I mean, you'll see pictures of Rion with a surveying thingy, that thing on the tripod. Um, uh, what's it called there, Corne? A, a, a spirit level. Dumpy. <laughs> the geologist, but you work on the mine, what's wrong? <laughs> okay, the, you know, see pictures of Rion standing on this empty ground, you know, giving of his time. Anyway, um, Amberlene goes to pray after hearing this news and just feels a direct witness of the Holy Spirit that this is what God has called us to. So amazing. Um, what I find fascinating is how God has a long game in, my, in mind. There's two things I know about God. He doesn't run. He walks. And he's always got a long game in mind. He moves in big narrative arcs over our lives. Isn't it amazing? Um, you know, you might find out in 10 or 20 years that part of your upbringing was so key to your present or future moment. Um, I find it crazy that I've always had a longing to live in Kwasulu Natal as a young boy um, that was only reawakened a few weeks ago. Matthew, last week, my brother, highlighted that my dad first started ministering on the streets of Durban, and here I am returning to the place where his ministry started. I met Brian five years ago on a trip to the USA. One night he actually asked me to change beds, because he was struggling with his back on the mattress he was sleeping on. And here we are changing churches five years later. Um, Caitlin reminded me the other day that on the first trip that Vanessa and I did to West Point, when they were still meeting in Kloof Junior Primary, that I said in the car whilst driving through the area, this feels like home to me. The encouragement to you is that God will surprise you with how he brings your past and your future together for his good purpose, and it will be to your amazement. You'll say, can you actually believe that God worked it all out like this? 
more than a coincidence, a God incidence. Just as importantly as for us, as this became clear what was our next, so God spoke clearly to Vanessa and I about Renus and Ashley. It was quite a suddenly, but I just realized that God had been laying the foundation for their next so carefully over well, their whole lives, but more in particular from our vantage point, the last three years. Vanessa and I got to a stage early 2019 where we just felt the church was getting too big for her and I to be the only full-time eldership couple. And this was a private conversation we were having. And then, almost within weeks, one Sunday, my good friend and elder of this church, Henta Deal, turns to me, and out of the blue, without a conversation, he says to me, I think it would be a good idea for Ines and Ashley come and help you full-time in the ministry. And so it happened. Rena started working at the beginning of 2020. We had big plans, big dreams, but so did coronavirus. He had been working for an engineering company. He put in many years working his way up from an apprentice, abused. He just preached through Joseph, and as he's preached through Joseph, I'm like, you've had a Joseph experience, Renus. And he worked his way into management, and he was doing really well. He wouldn't say this, but I will say it. He was probably bringing in two-thirds of the company's income through his client base. Ever since I've known Renus and Ashley, they've expressed a deep desire to be in full-time ministry and to possibly even lead a church one day. In November 2019, Harry Lawrence um, from South City Church on the South Coast came to visit impromptu. Him and Wendy were in the area. And I remember it was the day that South Africa played Wales in the, Wales, Wales, Wales in the quarterfinal of the World Cup. And we actually went to go watch at Tenta and Christelle's house. But that day, Rena's come up here because you're going to have to help me explain the story. That day, Harry, knowing Renus was coming on full-time ministry, um, he said something to Renus, And I want you to just tell us what he said to you. Sure, if I remember correctly, yeah, he had a stand back-to-back -back and... Yeah, he literally did this with us, and he said to me, my job is to watch James's back and to clear the way for James to be able to do what he needs to do. I think that was more or less the gist of it, and, and that I should be like the, yeah, and, and yeah, I, I, yeah, that was basically it. Yeah. And, and you've done just that, Renus, and I want to thank you so much. You can be seated. Thank you for your analogy. Oh. And here's where I want to go with that is I believe great followers make great leaders. What makes a great follower? Well, Rory Dyer sat down with me about a year ago and he explained to me something from Genesis 49. It says, Jacob comes to bless his sons at the end of his life. He's in Egypt now, reconciled with Joseph, the son he hasn't seen or thought was dead. He starts to bless his sons, but he, but he doesn't say a whole bunch of nice son, stuff about all the sons. To Reuben, he says, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my strength and the first fruits of my virility, excelling in prominence, excelling in power, turbulent as water. You will not excel because you got into your father's bed and you defiled it. Uh, Reuben stepped with one of his father's wives. Simon and Levi their knives are vicious weapons. May I never enter their council. May I never join their assembly. For in their anger they kill men, and on a whim they hamstring oxen. Violent. So Reuben, betrayer. Simeon and Levi, vicious, angry, violent. But then Judah, Zebulun, and Issachar. They get commended. What makes a great follower? Judah means praise. Zebulun it's described as a harbor for ships, a place of safety, protection. Issachar, described as a donkey who would be willing to serve. And so Rory says to me, he says, you know what makes great followers and you know what makes men promotable? Is if they're not to praise what God is doing in someone else's life. Is if they're willing to protect other people is if, and if they're willing to serve like a donkey, the least of us. And Renus and Ashley, I want to say that you've praised the work of God through Vanessa and I, and it's been a great encouragement. You've protected us, and you've protected 
the people of this church, and you've served all around. And may that be a lesson to all of us. You know, I've got two kids, and one's doing ballet and the other's doing acro. And so when, when Kingsley, six years old, does a cartwheel, Summers doesn't say, oh, well done, Kingsley. She says, look what I can do, Dad. And she does a thingy. But that's kids, right? It's not about like, hey, I want to just say well done to you. It's like, oh, no, I don't want you to get the limelight. Look what I can do. And so that's why it's so key that we learn the lesson of praise. Am I able to praise the work that God is doing in someone else's life, even when I feel? Protect. Honor. Serve. Renus and Ashley have done that. They've given themselves fully to serving and growing in their calling and gifting over the last three years. They've done this by serving and loving the church, however they've been asked to do. I realized in that instance that God had been preparing them, a son in the house who cares for the house, who knows this house, who has stewarded and been entrusted with increasing responsibility in the house. And now the time for leading the house has been given to them. Renus and Ashley are the called, the God called man and woman for this season of solid ground. They're a gift to the body. Ephesians 4 tells us that Jesus give, gives gifts to his church, people with unique calling to build up the body. Renus and Ashley are a gift. He has a story about gifts. Who remembers Christmas Eve as a kid? Okay, how many of you got out of bed to go peek under the tree to check? What was, what to feel? Hold up. How heavy is this one? Uh, the beautiful thing is that Vanessa and I, because of our proximity and along with the elders, because of our closeness to them, have gotten to taste of the gift in their life. And we're so excited that you're going to get to unwrap this gift and get to experience the joy of the great surprise as you see what God is going to bring you through them. And so Vanessa and I just want to thank you. I want to thank you, Solid Ground. I want to thank each and every one of you that have sent us messages of encouragement, that have sent Renes and Ashley messages of encouragement, that have had faith for what God is doing in this season. We love you so much, Solid Ground. This is really hard. This is going to be really hard to say goodbye We've made lifelong deep friendships here. We've never pictured ourselves leaving this place until now. We would not be moving unless we really felt God was calling. Like I said last week, for us, this feels like a matter of obedience. We have to trust God that He knows what He is doing, even though we don't see the whole picture yet. That His plan for solid ground to grow and continue to do well and to bring Him glory through this is still on track. And that his plan for us at West Point will be good in every respect. So I just want to close with three things. The band can come up. What now? Well, late October, practically speaking, we'll have a transition Sunday in which we hand over the leadership of the church with joy and celebration. Sometime in November, Vanessa and I are trusting that we'll be able to move and that our house will be sold by then we'll be able to take over West Point at the end of November to begin the new year leading that church. I went paddling with a friend this week, great man. He won't mind me sharing this, um, but solid ground has been a real life-changing place for them as a family. And I realize that it's easy to take for granted what we have grown up in and enjoyed much of our lives. So I just want to spend a brief moment telling you about what makes solid ground special and why nothing about these fundamentals are going to change. This is a God-honoring, Christ-exalting, Holy Spirit-led, joyful, life-giving, radical, missional, real, authentic New Testament church. None of this changes. Let's read Acts 2 verses 41 to 47. We'll put it on the screen. So those who accepted his message, speaking of Peter's preaching, were baptized, and on that day about 3,000 people were added to them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together, and they held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. 
Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. It is from this passage of Scripture that we draw out our values. What is important to us? Worship, word, prayer, fellowship, friendship, mission. The pattern according to what we see in the book of Acts for the early church will remain the guide for solid ground church. Real, authentic, sinners saved by grace. Not someone coming here to try to put on a show. A place where the lost can come in. Not a place where the older brother tries to keep the younger brother out. A place of mercy, a place of grace, a place of life, a place for the young, a place for the old, a place where we celebrate the gospel being declared from one generation to the next, a place where we can have lights and loud music so that young people, and whatever the style will be in 10 years, will paint the building and refresh it, and the old people will celebrate for what the new people are experiencing, the same age-old truth in a church that might change its style a bit, will never change its message. We believe in the pattern of church leadership for New Testament. Elders and deacons, elders there to make sure that the doctrine, direction, dis discipline of the church are kept in check. And deacons there to serve the vision set by the elders. I want to call the core leadership up. Come and stand with me. You know, the beautiful thing about solid ground is that we, we want to resist traditions of men that start to encroach upon the life-giving Word of God. We want to resist structures and mechanisms that would actually we, would enslave us and prevent the life of the Spirit from being able to blow fresh upon us. One of the key things that we really believe is essential to ministry is that we do everything together out of our common love for Christ and out of personal relationship with one another. We want solid ground to be a family because God is building a family, a place of deep friendship. And so this is not a, just a functional team, you deacon, you elder, we do this, you do that, you do the accounting. That stuff is important, but you know what's more important is that we share a love of friendship with one another. And I pray and I believe that this is going to continue. And this church is in safe hands because of this group of friends who serve God together passionately. That is not going to change. We'll continue to be a colony of heaven, living out our witness together in this war zone of a world that is being reconciled back to Jesus. For solid ground in West Point, there's great adventure ahead. We believe that ministry should take place on the basis of real, authentic, relational partnerships in the gospel. And so, aka, mates in ministry, solid ground in West Point, we're going to have interaction for years to come. For you and I, what does this mean? Well, let's go back to 2 Corinthians 6 verses 11. We have spoken openly to you, Corinthians. Our heart has been opened wide. We are not withholding our affection from you. Don't worry, the next part is not for you, solid ground. He says, but you are not, you're withholding yours from us. That was to do with what was happening in the church then. But verse 13, I speak as to my children as a proper response, open your heart to us. And so what I want to leave with you this morning, in this transmission moment, it is our desires, leaders, and clearly that of the Holy Spirit, that the church is going to move, move through this in a unified and strengthened way, together in Christ in every way. So what can you and I do? We can open our hearts to one another, to what God is doing, to His kingdom come. We're not trying to offend anyone with this announcement. This is the ministry we have been given. Open your heart to what God is doing. Open your heart to the bigness of God's dealings, that we are a part of a worldwide body, the kingdom coming across the earth. Open your heart to the mission of God, which involves sending out. Open your heart to Jesus and His church. Open your heart to Renus and Ashley. Open your heart to this team of elders and deacons. We keep our eyes on Jesus and we get stuck into our local church, getting behind our leaders and trusting God wholeheartedly. What can you do to build the church? For some of us, we may not have yet discovered our gifting. 
We may not have been entrusted with leadership or with a ministry yet. But what we can all do is by the attitude of our hearts, we can fully embrace and fully get behind what Jesus is doing here at Solid Ground. In simple words, let's have an all in. I'm going to celebrate what God is doing here attitude and serve wherever I can. We are all part of the body. We're all in this together. We've all got to fight for this together. What's happening in solid ground is holy and sacred. A place where black and white, rich and poor, English, Afrikaans, Zulu, Kosa, Hind, uh, Indian, whatever your background, Eastern, Asian, can all be together as the picture that Jesus envisioned for his church. All nations coming together to worship the one true king. And I'm going to keep praying for solid ground. And I pray that we will all hold solid ground dear. Amen.